I, I want to thank uh, the King's College and Professor Bradley for, for having me here and uh, honored to, to have such illustrious co-panelists. I'm going to take as a starting point uh, what Professor Pfaff has established. Um, there's a there's a, a liberal trope or narrative from the new Jim Crow that you know President Obama has picked up on about nonviolent drug crimes being the driver of mass incarceration and a racist conspiracy. Professor Pfaff has laid out the numbers. You can't attribute the scale of the problem to that. And by the way, the history of the ramp up in the drug war is bipartisan and cross racial. So the standard kind of progressive critique doesn't work. What I'm going to do is speak to you as a conservative who has become convinced on conservative grounds that there's plenty still to reform here, right? We can't rest complacent just because the story that, that those on the other side of the aisle are telling is wrong. Just because they're wrong doesn't mean that, that things as they stand now are right. One of the first things to keep in mind if you, if you have any sympathy for conservative principles is Criminal justice is big government. Um, prison guard unions are big, important political actors. And we should expect them to serve their own interests as they do. Um, anyone know or can guess who the biggest donor was to the Doris Tate Crime Victims Bureau that successfully uh, put through California's three strikes law? Who, who, is there some rich group of little old ladies named Doris Tate giving a lot of money? Actually, the money came from the prison guards union, right? They funnel it through the victims' rights groups that are shells or, or, or facades for this. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is, in the wake of Ferguson, the Department of Justice's report on what was happening in Ferguson tell us that the local law enforcement was using criminal justice as a way to raise revenue right? Collecting lots of fines and tickets in a way that poisoned the legitimacy of criminal justice in a lot of people's eyes. So there's a lot here that a conservative concerned about government power and rent seeking and other things on the part of bureaucrats ought to, ought to see in criminal justice that we're very ready to see in other governmental institutions. And we shouldn't be surprised that it behaves that way. Um, the next thing is that if you want to fix a system that a lot of people think is bloated, and that I'm gonna explain why you might think it's, it, it, it harms things conservatives care about. There are ways in which you can punish and hold accountable, which I think a lot of, a lo a lot of people on the right-hand part of the spectrum care about, without disrupting things that we also care about, like families and communities, right? You, there's not this dichotomy between either you have to let people go, or you have to just you know, crush them like bugs. And I, I think that that's the wrong, the false dichotomy we tend to set for ourselves. The first point I wanna make is, there's actually something we can learn from the past and the way that we punish or punished. There's this awful American conceit that we today are so much smarter than anybody else who ever lived. And the people in the colonial era must have been idiots, right, or benighted or whatever. But whatever problems they had, and they had slaves, and they were racist, and they didn't treat women well, I'll grant all of that, um, we tend to focus on those kinds of things or the fact that there was some use of the death penalty or corporal punishments, actually much less than most people think. Not, we weren't as bloody as England. But the point I wanna make is that in America, punishment was mostly temporary, all right? This was a, this, the, 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 the American colonies, they punished someone, he got it over with, he paid back his debt, he went back to his life, all right? We had nothing like the current cast of ex-cons, which I think is a point that we ought to focus on the difference between punishing a wrong and boxing in a wrongdoer or branding something on his head. And sure, in the, in the colonies, one or two people a year got sentenced to the death penalty. Two people a year got sentenced to the death penalty in Pennsylvania. One a year actually got it. And a small handful of people got exiled. And a small handful of people got branded. But overwhelmingly, punishment was something you did. You took your lumps. You got shamed in front of the community. And then you went back. And overwhelmingly, the evidence is the community welcomed you back. There wasn't this category of violent offender, as, as Professor Foreman was mentioning. There was this sense there, but for the grace of God, go I. 
Other people do wrong things. I do wrong things too. This is an occasion to reflect on the problems of drunkenness, to, but at the same time to, 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 to empathize and to make restitution and to fix it. What happened in the 19th century is we moved from corporal punishments, which came to seem bloody and barbaric, towards prisons which seemed milder and more humane, but it was really a problem of out of sight, out of mind. The, 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 the experimenters, the social reformers, especially the Quakers in Pennsylvania, now my home state, thought you lock someone away with the Bible, his conscience will convict him. Well, it doesn't actually work that way. They turned very quickly into warehouses. Warehouses for people that we threw away. And they turned out to be criminogenic, right? Because what happens? Think about this as a conservative. What happens when you disrupt someone's family? What happens when you disrupt someone's work history? What happens when you disrupt someone's skills? What happens when you lock a juvenile away with a bunch of hardened criminals? What happens when you concentrate human capital? It forms networks. If you concentrate them in Silicon Valley, you get Silicon Valley firms. If you concentrate them in a prison, you get criminal networks that plan the next crimes when people get out. This is a crazy strategy. It makes about as much sense as telling all the child molesters that they all have to live in the same motel on the wrong side of the tracks or live homeless under the same bridge. It sounds like a great slogan until you think through what happens down the line. Um, it breeds crime, and there are lots of ways in which it does that. Um, but if you care about families and work and communities, you should realize that rap radically disrupting this for years of someone's life, maybe it's only two or three years, as Professor Pfaff says, but two or three years is long enough for you to lose your job, lose your apartment, lose your house, lose your wife, lose your kids, lose all the things that are powerful restraining impulses on you know, young testosterone-fueled men who, if not restrained and channeled in law-abiding ways, are disproportionately the crime committers in our, in our society. I mean, the single biggest predictor of crime is having a Y chromosome. We know that. And there is a series of social institutions that cause young men to settle down, including getting married, having a job, having kids, and we sever people from all of that. Another problem I have with the way we approach crime is that we treat criminals uh, as if they are fully informed rational actors. This is a classic economic model. I prosecuted criminals. I've never met a single fully informed rational actor. Now, I'm sure there are some embezzlers who are really doing a cost-benefit analysis. But most of the people who commit crimes are short-sighted risk takers. Who else is going to get risk getting shot in robbing a convenience store to steal $300 and a six pack of beer? And what cost benefit calculus does this make sense? And yet, the way we approach these offenders is, we're going to promise a small chance of getting arrested, and then several years later, or a year later, a long dose of imprisonment, and in the meantime, you're over optimistic, you think you're not gonna get caught, if you get caught, you might get away with it. This is far off in the future. What we know about real human beings is that immediacy and certainty of punishment matter a lot more than severity far off in the distance, right? So short-sighted risk takers, the way you have to reach them is something like Hawaii's intensive probation program, HOPE. If you have a dirty urine on a random day one week, you will go to jail for this weekend. It won't prevent you from going to your Monday to Friday job. It won't sever your ties to your family. Amazingly, like 80, 85% of people stop using drugs immediately when they know they're being watched. Uh, if, if you give them a couple of chances, by the end of the, the, this period, almost everybody has gone clean without treatment. People need to know there's certain immediate sanctions and most of them will avoid committing crimes. Um, there are other things we can use that don't disrupt families as much. GPS, GPS technology, immensely cheap now and powerful. Why are we locking people up and not giving them bail based on risk of flight? Large, large numbers of people missing months of work when you can just track them with a smartphone. I mean, think about how much more disruptive that is of employment and of families than the alternatives. Um, and there are lots of diversion courts and alternatives where for the people whom we're not really concerned are that sliver of the, the, the most dangerous people, there are other ways to track them and monitor them than necessarily locking everyone away as if everybody was a homicidal maniac. Um, we know that, that more than two-thirds of the people in the criminal justice system have problems relating to their crimes of drug use, alcohol abuse, mental illness, or some combination thereof. Why don't we focus our efforts to re re reduce harm and do our pretrial supervision on 
making people take their medications, getting them supervised so they're not using these, these substances that contribute to the crime. My final point is, if you are a conservative and you want to punish but minimize the collateral damage of the punishment, think about reweaving the social fabric, all right? What does that mean for families, all right? Why is it that politicians brag about sending pr prisoners far off to the other end of the state, as far away from their families as they can? It's a crazy strategy. Why sever them? And then, we're, then we're, we wonder why people don't take, men, young men don't take, take care of their children. You've made it impossible to maintain contact with them. Why is it that we have extortionate collect call rates and burdensome visitation procedures? Skype is free now. You know, you could charge actual cost and do whatever you could to maintain connections with families while they're in prison. Why don't we have child support as a part of what prisoners are doing? Um, victims, likewise. One thing we know is that victims are not literally as punitive as most people assume. They want some restitution, they want some punishment. At the same time, what a lot of them would like is an apology, an opportunity to, to re release their fear that they're being stalked by this person, and a lot of victor offender mediation opportunities to talk can combine some punishment with some forgiveness. And it's remarkably effective in making victims also, as long as it's, they're not coerced into it voluntarily, making them feel better off. And often, by the way, victims are related to, or coworkers of, or, or spouses of defendants. They may have to go back to living with these people. We ought to do more to heal those relationships where, where it can be done. Work. It is a crazy thing that in the Great Depression, small business interests and labor unions conspired to shut down prison labor. We pay 40, 50,000 a year to keep inmates in idleness all their time. We have to repeal the Davis-Bacon Act, make it possible for inmates to work in prison, to cultivate skills other than just making license plates. I mean, in the federal government, Texas and Louisiana do more of this, and that's what you need to maintain a history of skills and employment that can lead to employment on the outside after people are released. And the, my, the final thing I wanna talk about is the role of religion. We need more studies but there are promising results from programs like Chuck Col the late Chuck Colson's Prison Fellowship Ministries because the problem is we do a terrible job of reentry in this country. We don't have money. We give people $20 in the bus ticket when they get out of prison. And of course they go back to dealing on the street corner. What other options have we given them? We've given them res residency restrictions. They're not allowed to live with their families. They're not allowed to hold down a whole bunch of jobs, much of which we need to pay back because it's, it's protect fine, don't be a preschool teacher, but we shouldn't bar people from being plumbers and beauticians because of their criminal record. It's crazy protectionism. But the, these kinds of fellowship programs can connect inmates with people in local congregations. And what we know is that people need a social network, right? They need a congregation that's praying with them, looking out for them, teaching them skills, getting them an apartment, getting them a job. And it's pretty clear in the New Testament Christ is unequivocal about going and ministering to those in prison as among the least of you. And when you've done it to them, you've done it to me. So there are a lot of people who understand this to be part of their religious obligation. And the, the left has forgotten how to punish, but the right has forgotten how to forgive. And the forgiveness after appropriate punishment is a part of it. There has to be a way to reintegrate people and if congregations, if we can deal with the First Amendment problems, right? you can't, you can't punish someone more harshly because he won't agree to a religious program, but if it's voluntary on the same terms, there are lots of inmates willing to opt into it, you can have a more orderly prison environment and a way for people to transition back out with the kind of reentry and support services that congregations can provide that unfortunately public funding is unwilling to provide. So the long and short of it is there's plenty to be pessimistic about. The scale of the problems are, are enormous. But there's still room for some hope, and I tend to think that some of that hope comes from going back to the future um, and looking at um, the kind of family and faith and community and work that have worked in our past. Thank you.